And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Welcome once again to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and it is my great honor to welcome each and every one of you into the Puritan Barn, the Now You See TV studios, with my co-host John Pounders for another Midnight Ride. Tonight is going to be a little bit on the spicy side. Oh, yeah, that's right. The broadcast for this evening is entitled Hollow Earth, The Serpent City, and the dragon people. And you might not have known there was a serpent city. So stick around and we're going to be hearing all about it. And get ready. You won't have to wait very long because it all starts right now because we are now live, live, live. What's up, guys? I always love saying those words. It, it's really mm -hmm. it's really crazy that this has become one of the things that we say every time. But I, I, it's like I can't not say it. I've been wanting to several mm -hmm. times. I'm like, I'm not going to say that anymore. But just wouldn't Every be the time. same without it. It wouldn't be the same without it. But either way, guys, let us know how you are all doing in the chat. Let us know where you're from, all of that good stuff. We love to hear it And if you're in live listening. Uh, but if you're not, if you're in just in the comment section and you're listening to it after the live, please let us know how you're doing out there. We love to hear that. And uh, tonight's going to be awesome. Like David said, this is going to be a subject that is intriguing. Um, now, I'm, I know a lot of people are looking to a show that I talked about before and this was about the mark of the beast and it was also about the bloodline of the beast right this was uh it was, was what it was all about and i was going to do a second part where it broke down heraldry and so i'm still planning on doing that uh, the author of the book um antichrist and a cup of tea reached out to us uh because he wanted us to interview him and so when his new book comes out the new version of his book comes out we do plan on interviewing him so i'm going to hold that one off for that time because I think it's really uh, hopefully be an interesting interview um, in, which is something we haven't done for a long time if you guys haven't noticed so we're excited about that and before we get started I want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors for tonight's show um, of course you know how to visit myself and David's website and I'll tell you in case you don't you can go to nystv.org and that is my website um, now you see TV's website and um, just the website that we have a lot of information on and then FOJC radio, which is David and Donna's website where they have their information that they've had for over 40 different years and 40, not well, obviously different years, 40 years of information kind of condensed into one site. So make sure you guys check those out. If you would like to see how you can support or what we're doing. Um, also uh, check out sugar and spice soap company and their products are 100 percent natural uh, awesome products you can rub on your skin and not feel guilty about worrying if you're inducing harmful chemicals into your skin uh, they even have a midnight ride brand just for you guys that you guys can check out and they and it's just awesome you get 10 percent off if you use the code nystv also watts leather amazing leather work done from a craftsman uh, from a leather craftsman that is just uh, really awesome. If you guys know how me and David are, me and David love books. And so the idea of having a book cover that just matches the book that we're reading or, or having a journal cover that matches the notes that we're taking, uh, having you know, a bracelet that we has a message that we want to have on it or a gun holster, etc. Uh, he can do it for you. And even actually this wallet, which I don't know if he still has any of these, but these were like a special edition NYS TV wallet. I've had this thing for like six years and it still looks almost brand new. Also has RFID blocker, which is really important. So make sure you guys check all those links out. The links are in the description. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, David, that's pretty much all I got. I know you've got oh, we've got some shows coming up. Breaking Babylon is not going to be coming up this Sunday. John is still healing, but we should be back next Sunday for that. David, I know you have shows coming up this weekend as well. We have a Sunday night live 
on our Underground Church channel, 8 p.m. Central Time. It will be Lucy in the Skies. And Tracy Vinay is going to have a broadcast on weather modification. I guarantee it'll rock. I've been uh, looking at some of the stuff she's got. It is going to be profound. So that is there for any of you that would like. Fantastic. So are we ready to ride, David? We're ready to ride. Let's go. All right. So I'm going to start mm -hmm. by just kind of discussing a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight. So tonight, the whole goal behind this show is to bring out a mystery that I believe is not only mysterious in all throughout the world, in every mythology, every religion, but also in the scripture. There is this spoken language about this dragon and about this dragon seed and about the idea that these entities are at war with the seed of the woman and this is mentioned in genesis and we're going to talk a little bit about this and, and all of these pictures here represent all of the different ideas about this serpent bloodline people have given so many different serpent ideology to so many different things that we're going to try to just tread through what's real what's not and see if we can make something of it. And the reason that I think it's so important that we do so is because in this age that we're going through right now, um, being able to decipher the dragon and the deception is crucial. And the reason I believe it is so crucial right now as opposed to any other time in history is because we are in the midst of something prophetic that may get it ready to happen. And I'll show you why I believe that. Uh, in Revelation 21 through 3, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him 1,000 years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed to season. Now, myself and David both believe that we are in the end of this season right here to where now we are in the thousand year reign where Satan is bound, either bound or getting ready to be unbound in this particular time period. But we are going through some particular years right now to where major deception is happening. And the reason I think it's so close upon us, and, and I'm just going to read this from Finnegan's handbook, a biblical chronology. Um, and there, it says there are two possible dates for the crucifixion. AD 30 and AD 33. The latter is the date given by Usher Finnegan with the best modern research at his fingertips is able to decide conclusively between them. AD 33 seems to be the correct date because the New Testament implies and the apocryphal acts of Pilate affirm that there was an eclipse of the moon as well as an obscuration of the sun in the latter or afternoon phase of the crucifixion and, and in AD 33 but not in AD 30. There was an eclipse of the moon in the day of Passover, the day of the crucifixion, and that eclipse occurred in the late afternoon. The same lunar eclipse is described in what claims to be an eyewitness account by Dionysius the Aeropagite. So we have this idea, and I believe that this is probably true. When you look back at, and you can map star charts, you can do all these different things, and you can go back and see when the eclipse happened and when it happened on Passover. And conclusively, uh, I believe that this is probably the date that it happened. Now, we're, we're stuck with some interesting things when it comes to time, guys. We're stuck with a time period like no other uh, to where deception is at its highest right now to where we can't decipher mm -hmm. true history. Now, myself and David have studied history for a long time. This was my one of my favorite subjects in, in high school, through college, through after that. And now, still to this day, I've read more books in the last few years on this stuff than I ever read going through all the education. that And I know David can say the same thing. The last few years, we've read so many books that have tried to draw pieces of the puzzle together, realizing that there are puzzle pieces missing, realizing that there's something going on with our history. Now, if that date is correct, then if we go by the dating system that we have now, that puts us almost exactly 2,000 years from AD 30, because 2030 is the year that would lead us to 2,000 years. Now, we know that the Agenda 2030, all of these different things point to a one-world government 100%. If you don't know about it, Agenda 2030, Google it, see. They played it all out there for you guys. There's literally no idea that this, there's, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is 100%. They put it out there. They lined it up. This is what they're going to do. And the idea is you're going to own nothing, be happy. You're going to be subjugated to the, uh, the one-world government. 
and this is uh, the end goal, and there's going to be a major depopulation going on as well that it talks about. Now, let's say that 2,000 years is correct, which is pretty profound already. Now, there is, knowing that history has been flawed, uh, there is this ideology out there that seems to be able to be almost backed up to where the Dark Ages were invented, and we have a 1,000 years actually added to history. Now, this is... 100% in my opinion possible when you look at history there's so many overlapping things that happen it makes you wonder if they're talking about the same person you have this in all mythologies as well different mythologies that claim different dates but they have the same characters mentioned so you there is this possibility that there is a thousand years missing and there's a lot of ed, there's a lot of education on that Fomenko wrote books on it uh, it's really interesting but one thing to note before I get David's opinion on all this um, the AD, AD system was actually instituted by Dionysius Exegus, which is a Scythian monk, and he invented this system through that, which if you know anything about the Scythians, if you watched the last show David did on Dan, then you'll understand the significance of the Scythians having their hand in playing a part in our calendar today, which is sus nonetheless. I don't know if, if no, none of you know what sus means. My kids say it all the time. It means suspicious, very suspicious. <laughs> David, what do you think? Well, it certainly is uh, said, isn't it? Yeah. And um, yeah, Mr. Fomenko and Vite, that guy's a hoot. Um, there are some things that we know we obviously would not agree with him with, and there's some things he comes up with that, wow, yeah, uh -huh, we really do agree with him on. And there are historical gaps. Uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky, he has written in... Uh, worlds or, or ages of chaos and he concluded that there's about a 600 to 1800 year gap just in the egyptian timeline yeah. uh, the father of egyptology with athanathius kircher who was a jesuit and a lot of his pictures were reproduced by manly p hall in the secret teachings of all ages and i i believe velikowski is also right there's about 800 years there gone fomenko has i believe his theory is that it is nearer to our time period where that gap is and in the the biblical chronology the fellow that done that was a good irish puritan called bishop usher and he put the creation at uh, 4004 bc wow now there, there's a fellow, the father of young earth creationism, Henry Morris. He makes the point that Mr. Usher, he said, boy, done a great job, but he did not consider gaps in the genealogies. Yeah. And the very father of young earth creationism, Mr. Morris, says that the creation of Adam could go back as far as 10,000 B.C. Wow. So we got gaps in these timelines. We got gaps and we have to, history is written by the winners. So we have to be very judicious when we begin, when we look at history and especially when we begin coordinating the biblical history with the secular. There's a lot involved there and uh, we cannot rule out the possibility of gaps. Yeah, it's really interesting. I don't know about a thousand years, but I do know that the Dark Ages are an interesting time in history, David. There's not a lot of real history written during that time period. It's really interesting. And yeah. we'll talk a little bit about some of the lineages during those time periods here in the show. Mm. But if there's truly a thousand years, which is there's also the idea like you used to use these little J's in front of the 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 dates, which look like ones, right? They look uh -huh. like ones. And so how hard would it be? this many generations later to convince people that we're actually a thousand years further than what we are and what would yeah. be the reason behind that. And I think we can come up with some reasons, but what would in your mind, David, what is the reason? Well, it would be for orchestrating their version of Bible prophecy and for trying to make things to, to appear that they are playing a certain role in the prophetic history and destiny yep. and to try to show themselves as something special and also there's the motive to cover up things that uh, they don't want people to know there's always that also i agree i think that's 100 percent the reason i think you know if you can cover up certain bits of information that gives you so much power you know we talked about dan last time in the in the last show that we were talking about and you were talking about how they kind of seized the day they really did they seized the day in order to gain yeah. control over everything yeah. they were a big kingly lineage of people they were strong 
wise, all these different things. And they saw what happened, right? They've seen what happened in history. They realized, okay, there's an opportunity for us to here to step in as a people. And if we can manipulate time, we can manipulate the stories. Guess what? We're going to be the one they serve. And I, th- yeah. and I really truly believe that's what they did. Yeah. So yeah. anyways, um, possible. I, and when I say I truly believe, just know that I'm human. My beliefs are matter very little in the whole scheme of things. It's just an interesting thing to bring out. I just thought that it was interesting. So um, back to what we're talking about here. So I'm going to read this verse. This says in Genesis 3.15, and it says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. This is talking about the serpent. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise its his heel. And in Revelation 12, we have the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have their testimony of Jesus. So so we can verify who the seeds are. I'm going to do this real quick. So this right here tells us exactly who the remnant of the seed is uh, and who Satan's after. Now, if somebody's not following the commandments of God and they don't have the testimony of Jesus, guess what? The devil is not after them. Satan is not after them. He's after these people because they are the true remnant of the seed. People can trace their lineages all day long, but unless these two character traits are added to that person, it means absolutely nothing. And because we know throughout the Bible, we even see it in the Bible, we see it in almost every other lineage society, the the races and stuff have become so mixed from what their original sources were that there's no way to distinguish this anymore. The chances of us not all having some sort of DNA from Israel in our blood is really almost insignificant amount of chances because they were scattered amongst the nations all over the world. So there's there's no specific, in my opinion, there's no specific root of these people genetically that the Bible's talking about. It's talking about a spiritual root. And I think that a lot of this stuff has a spiritual root, including the dragon bloodline has a spiritual root in all this. And so we're going to go on to this next verse here. And I believe that when we're talking about a serpent seed, this is what we're talking about. Now, there are the people that believe that Cain was of the lineage of the serpent. And we'll talk a little bit about that because this is what the bloodline, the grail bloodlines actually believe. They believe that, right? But when in the Bible were revealed some things that are hidden by the church for some reason. They've been hidden for a long time. This Genesis 6, 4, I went to a Christian school, guys. Get this. My whole life, I went to a Christian school. I went to Bible College Seminary. And never once was this even really truly discussed with any sort of skepticism whatsoever. And I mean, the Sethite theory was it, boom. And then you taught that, you don't even think about it unless your spiritual eyes are open. But this is a clue, and the Book of Enoch is also a clue to what actually happened here. And David, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, and it is amazing, something that I think is just so overwhelmingly clear biblical, biblically, and the most of the modern Bible schools and pulpits are just oblivious to it. It's amazing. Yeah. And so I'm just going to read this verse right here. Most of you guys already see it up there, but I want you guys to just be aware of it if you're not. If this is your first time hearing this, this is going to be profound for you because it was for me. You know, I studied histories, I studied mythologies, and I'm thinking, where does the Bible fit in with all of these different stories that are happening? Surely the Bible talks about them, right? It has to. And so when you stumble across this, it makes you realize that, yes, it does. And it tells a narrative from the side of the holy versus the side of the dragon. And so it says, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became the mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And we read about these men of renown all through Greek literature, Roman literature, uh, Syrian literature, all of the different literatures, we hear about these men of our mighty of renown, the men that led armies, the men that subjugated kingdoms, right? We heard about, we've heard about these people. And I'm going to read this excerpt here from Genesis of the Grail Kings in page 108. Um, I think that this shows exactly what the enemy believes. And the reason that they believe that the Grail bloodline is the actual bloodline is because they believe this. And this is how people get deceived. This is how people uh, lead themselves into Gnosticism and also lead themselves into whatever, what the one world religion is going to be. People think New Age is all like, New Age, we're different, we're not this. But what you believe in New Age is the exact same thing that the people, the elites believe, the dragon bloodlines believe, believe that or not. And so we have to be aware of this. Literally every civilization in the world other almost than the Hebrew civilization, the Israel civilization, which is us, right? Because we believe in the commandments and we have the testimony of Jesus. 
believe that the dragon is a good thing. In Chinese literature, the dragon represents wisdom. Assyrian uh, represents wisdom. In almost every civilization on the earth, the dragon and the serpent represents wisdom. This is why we have them plastered, these serpents plastered all over our hospitals, all over everything, because this is what it represents to these people. Now, we're, I'm going to read from page 108 in Genesis of the Girl Kings. Now, to set up Genesis of the Girl Kings, for those of you that have not heard us talk about it, I believe that the man who wrote this, Lawrence Gardner, um, was a very smart man when it came to these things. He was the uh, he's a 30-30 group Freemason. He was the director of Antiquities of Scotland, and he was the bookkeeper, basically a genealogist for all of these bloodlines. Now, I also believe that he had a enmity towards God. He hates God, the true God. And so the things that I read from here, we're going to look at it from a standpoint that is a biblical standpoint rather than his standpoint. But this is what he reads, and this is why it's important that we've talked about Serpent Seed before, and we've literally pointed to it a, a being against uh, the idea that Satan had sex with Eve and created a, a satanic child out of that branch. and But this is what they believe, and I'm just going to read this. This is on page 108, and it says, It is worth noting that the senior royal descent was not from the line of Eve's third son, Seth, as portrayed in his Genesis. It was in accordance with the earliest matriarchal tradition, the line from her first and senior son, Cain, the character so maliciously discredited by the Christian church. Now, it gives Cain as this idea that he's just been so discredited. I mean, he killed his brother, but I mean— Got a bad rap. Got a bad rap. Killed his brother, and you'll find out, too, that he did a lot of other things. You know, his lineage did some other things as well. But this is what they truly believe. Now, this is a family tree in the Bible, and I think the Bible calls Leviathan the twisting serpent for a reason because he twists things. This is so interesting because you have some of the same exact names throughout the— lineage of Cain versus the lineage of Seth. Now, you have all of these down. Now, we did a show, David, when we got down to Lamech down here on the side of Cain. If you look down here on the left side of this chart mm -hmm. and you see Lamech there, we have some interesting sons' names here that a lot of you guys are probably familiar with. And you did a show on this. Now, I want to read this verse, and we'll, I want to ask you a little bit about this uh, right. strange son of Lamech. In Genesis 4, it says, And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And Lamech said unto his wives, Adah and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare him a son, and calls his name Seth. For God said, this is for God said, not, not Lawrence Gardner, not the Gnostics, nothing. That she, he said that, uh, for God said, she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. So we see here that the idea of the kingly lineage that they through Cain is not the same idea of the kingly lineage that we see through the line of Seth, right? So this is a really um, divisive subject here, but it's worth noting that the only people that believe this are the people who believe that the dragon and the, and the uh, serpent is the good guy, the people that believe that Cain is literally um, the son of Satan. Um, did you have anything you want to add to that, David? I did want to talk about the strange son of Lamech as well, because you did a show on that in the Book of Enoch, which is on YouTube, guys. You should check it out if you haven't, because it was awesome. So underrated. I don't know why. It's only got like 40,000 views, which almost all our shows now are getting you know close to 100,000 eventually. You guys have to go back and check this one out. But David, give us a little insight into Enoch 106 and why, what, why is it saying what it's saying? Well... I have said repeatedly, and John has also, that the translation of the Book of Enoch that we prefer is the R.H. Charles. Now, w you cannot hold the Book of Enoch to the level of Scripture, which does not mean that there's not great profit there for us to have from reading it. Now, in the 106th chapter of the Book of Enoch, in the R.H. Charles translation, it explains to you that this was added on. It's an addenda to the original book of Enoch, added on. Yeah. And in this added on chapter, if you would take this as for what it says, Noah would have been a Nephilim. Yeah. <laughs> Noah was not a Nephilim. It's the total reverse jacked up story. It's a bogey. So uh, there was some lady the other day sent an email chewing me out for not giving, saying the book of Enoch scripture. Well, 
I'm sorry, you know, we can't because it's not. We don't now, have that authority either. That's no, not something that no, we have the authority a, to do. That's above my pay grade. Yeah. Now, one thing about this and about the the serpent seed of the Eve having sex with the devil, every false doctrine is intended to cover up the truth. And whenever you go down a false bunny trail, you're not going to pick up the truth. But in Genesis 4 and 1, this is a false doctrine, and it's a very dangerous one, not only because it will make you look for truth somewhere where it's not and not look where it is. But in Genesis 4 and 1, there's some very blasphemous turns in the road you have to go through to come up with this doctrine. Like in Genesis 4 and 1, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The King James Bible there, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. This is the Tetragrammaton, yod heh Now, there's a guy out there that says that yod heh is Satan because he quotes a Targum and he turns yod heh into Satan. Oh, it says Lord, but that means Satan. Yeah. Now, I tell you, this is this is just flirting with your soul there my friends yeah. it's flirting with your soul when you just play mr twister with the bible to come up with whatever you want to cut up come up with so this is uh very very important for us to understand that uh, in a lot of ways that that's a false doctrine and to look at the book of enoch in a proper perspective and especially go back and watch that midnight ride because it's very important especially all of you students of the book of enoch you need to understand it go back and watch that midnight ride i agree man they have to i, I can't believe um it's interesting because that book it talks about so lamech had this son that was like the shiny ones, right? He was yeah. like the elves, the the elves, and he yeah. was he had the red head, red hair, and all of these different things that it talked about, which is interestingly exactly what we see in these dragon bloodlines, right? Yeah. Have, we see this yeah. uh, being portrayed over and over and over again. So, anyways, and, and real yeah, quick, ahead. just one other thought there: when you understand that they're believing that serpent seed line through Cain why they give so much emphasis to second and third Enoch yes. because the Enoch, the evil, he was from the line of Cain and in third Enoch, which is totally, uh, Kabbalistic Enoch becomes the little yod heh Yeah. So it, you can really follow the consistency of the little demonic twistings they do, uh, all through the, the line there. Agreed. And so, the the line that they do that that twist line is the probably the most frightening thing about all this because the deception is so deep i mean it's really hard to see through it because if you really truly believe that this because the ideology behind like the, the grail kings for instance is that this grail kings were way before the idea of mary magdalene jesus this was anunnaki right grail kings this is what they talk about in these books anunnaki this so the An anunnaki all right let's get that now this is really a popular subject and a lot of people truly um look at this because this is one of the first books that have ever been written that talk about these beings right they talk about these beings as being gods and so they believe that that lineage is what is important now they also say that the kings comes from the word Cain because that's what the kingly lineage would have came from is the word Cain. And then you have the priestly lineage that would have came from Shem, right? You have all of these uh, ideologies. And so when you see this deception, it looks so real to people that aren't studying the word of God. You can't, you cannot not be deceived if you have not studied the Bible and believe it. If you don't believe the Bible, you will most definitely fall for what they're saying because what they're saying is such a twisted way, such a, such a subtle deception that there is absolutely no way, unless you know the word, unless the Holy Spirit is with you, that you will overcome this deception. And I and I really believe that. Uh, David, do you believe that as well? Oh, yeah. And that that's just what this is. Well, the Bible says it was from the Lord, but you listen to some guy talk out of both sides of his mouth for about 15 minutes. Oh, I see. It's really Satan. Yeah, It's destroyed. So where if, if you can't believe the Bible here, where can you believe it? Right. It totally does away with the, the final authority of Scripture and puts it in the hand of some little uh, Johnny Jackleg preacher. Yeah, I mean, it's it's literally you're going to be pro-serpent, 
or pro not or you know anti serpent. That's really the, the only boils down to. I mean, because look, yeah. the, the the Bible and the serpent is clear that the serpent deceived the world. Very clear. Other religions not so clear. They think the serpent was the good guy, and it's all mixed up and twisted. So yeah. It's, it's yeah. And when you get into Luciferian theology, what Blavatsky she talks about holy Satan that the serpent in the garden was Yodhe Vafe. Yeah. It's exactly what they say. Yeah, it, exactly. exactly what they say. And so with that being said, we're going to move forward a little bit. So I want to talk because I want to get into the idea of this serpent seed, these serpent people, these serpent cities. And in order to do that, I have to set up some of this stuff. So here, how did, and my question has always been this, and, and I think we've talked about it many times, and, and I think we've hit the nail on the head many times about it, but how did the seed of the serpent get on the other side of the flood? Uh, this is a something that's been debated, hotly debated by many, many people. Um, and of course, if you believe that the, the and I, I really also don't believe that, I know uh, Rob Skiba, who was a friend of ours, he believed that uh, the bloodline of the daughters of Noah was tainted. I'm not 100% sure about that. I don't believe that. I don't believe God would have preserved uh, in that arc, that bloodline like that. And I'm nothing against anybody that likes what Rob says there. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm going to look at the Bible, see what it says, and we're going to try to figure it out from there. And we're also going to try to figure it out from other sources to try to see how that works out. Uh, now, we know that the the giants were there post-flood. We know this for a fact. And in, in Numbers, the, the word Nephilim is mentioned again in the Old Testament, post-flood, Numbers 13.33. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, who came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so they were in their, so we were in their sight. So there's this lineage of Anak, which is where we get the Anunnaki. This is the lineage of the Anunnaki, still transferred over post flood into the Fertile Crescent region, uh, still dominators of that, dominators of that society, also subjugated to, uh, which is interesting, the new Malish. You have. Um, Marduk, who subjugates the dragon underneath him, and you see there's a, I don't have this picture included, but you'll see the statue of Marduk with the serpent at his feet as he transverses the river, because in the in this thing, he actually overcame the serpent and was the ruler of them, which is portrayed in history as well as Nimrod was in control of the entire region of the area, including the Anakim, right? Well, what happened with all of this, and, and we've explained that in several shows too, David, when he talks about the Tartarian kings, etc., he explained that these guys were ran out, they were ran over to Philistine, and they were, you know, kind of became the Philistines, and they also became uh, the people in Bashan and all of this, they, they branched, branched out. This is also portrayed in these books um, as well, their lineage is portrayed all through that to make sense of it, but they were the lineage of these Anunnaki. And the, like I said, the Bible clearly talks about these things, and it talks about the Nephilim post-flood. Now, the question is, how did they survive without breathing, right? How did they survive with um, everything intact? And this is where the whole idea of the submerged areas of the world, the hollow earth, the serpent cities that are underground kind of takes place. And we'll talk a lot more about that in a little bit. I got a special video for you guys to watch that I think will super, it will be super intriguing. I mean, it was intriguing to me because I had never heard of this before, uh, but it is, it is a real thing. David, did you have anything you wanted to add before I moved on? Well, to I don't need slide? to say a whole lot here, but we've talked before about how Cain was banished from the face of the earth and that a good port of the very possible that, a, a huge part of the lineage of Cain was underground and maybe totally so at the beginning. Uh, and also, you know, Job 26 and 5, it says that dead things are formed from mm -hmm. under the waters and the inhabitants thereof, literally Rephaim. So, yeah. the, and this ties in with what I will be talking about on the next ride, the sacred marriage, which is the the ancient ritual all the way back to the beginning of the mysteries to bring forth that fully human, fully fallen angel child, to bring forth that crossbred child with humanity and fallen angels through uh, the rituals of magic. Yeah, I think that's a huge part in all of this that people fail to understand that the rituals of magic literally are formulated to change the DNA to change who you are because yes. when you epigenetics changes who you are and so when certain actions are portrayed that changes who you are just like i believe that cain when he murdered his brother it changed him it changed him to a certain way and then we see lamech saying 
I did this and this. I'm 70 times seven that, right? And so there, you have the same kind of ritual. And this is uh, this is why I believe that the deception of human sacrifice and all of these different rituals are so big in the occult because they truly believe that by doing that, they are becoming something better and something bigger. And, and of course, we've talked about the starfire rituals that they have, which boils down to Anunnaki female blood. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not going to get too gross with it, but they they would drink this this menstrual blood and but it also represented the bloodline, right? The bloodline of the yeah. Anunnaki dragon queens um, yeah. that is all prevalent throughout this whole thing. So with that being said, we've talked about these bloodlines up to a certain point. Now we get into another era in history of these bloodlines, and they are called the Fisher Kings. Now, a lot of people have not heard of the Fisher Kings, but ultimately the Fisher Kings, uh, these are the different names for them in different parts of the country. You have the Egyptian uh, you have the Syrian, you have the even the English, you have Arthur Pendragon, which uh, means King Dragon, right? You have these these associations with these Fisher Kings. Now, the Fisher Kings are super interesting because they uh, have the symbolism of the fish, right? They have this fish symbolism, symbolism. They are from the Anunnaki. They are where Inki comes from. They are these priest gods that r literally embody that of a fish. Now, I'm going to read to you guys from... Genesis of the Grow Kings once again, and I'm also going to read in Bible, and I'm going to show you how this all plays out because I think it's really important that we understand that it's very possible that this is how the lineage took forth in there, and I believe this is how it is because there's an unbroken uh, lineage thing here in in these books that talks about this, and and so do I believe that there's possible that there was bad DNA in some of Noah's sons' wives? I'm sure that that's a possibility, but I don't understand why. Um, God wouldn't have destroyed them as well, you know, as as w as easy as he could have. Um, he he literally opened up the ground for a certain amount of people in a certain area to destroy him. So, like, the idea that these, his wives, they, the only wives they could find were tampered DNA, I just don't, I'm not buying it. I don't know. I'm, it could be wrong. Well, and the Bible says that Noah was pure in his generations, yeah. his line, his yeah. family. And I think certainly that would imply certainly his children. I, I agree. And their wives. That's why God chose to preserve them, like you said. I agree, man. Yeah. I, it has to be. It. And my and, and if, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Doesn't really in the whole scheme of things. I'm not you know that worried about it. But I think that ultimately this is probably how it all happened. So uh, I'm going to read this from Genesis of the Gr Grail Kings. I'm going to read in page two and page three here, and it says to the Celtic races of Europe, the Celtic races of Europe, the dragon was the ultimate symbol of sovereignty. Hence the Dark Age Pendragons, the Head Dragons, or King of Kings. So Pendragon literally means, the etymology means King Dragon or the Head Dragon. And this is literally who they would call the King of Kings. And you see this title played out in, in the Bible with Nebuchadnezzar being titled the King of Kings. Um, now I'm going to read on here in the next page in part three. It says, historically dragons were the epitome of the royal crocodile or the sea serpent of the Dark Age Fisher Kings and the medieval Merovingian Kings of the Franks. And so you have this association with these kings that come from the idea of the dragon, um, th which is really important to understand because this is, in symbolism, we talked about Philistines and we talk about Palestine. We'll get back more into that with this because this really ties in perfectly to what the Bible talks about. But these are some ancient Sumerian depictions of Dagon. This one here on the right is a picture of Dagon. Uh, on the left here is one of the Assyrian uh, kings or the priestly kings that is represented in this picture as well. And you have these pictures that are clear association to the Dagon with the Pope, with the mitre, uh, with the wand, and all and, and this. I mean, there's a very clear association here. Of course, there are people that would try to say, oh, that's not what it's talking about. Dagon's not even a fish god. But I beg to differ. I've seen very many uh, results uh, on the idea that it's true, and, and I don't know how people can not believe that at this point, but I guess there are a few people out there that would like to differ on that. So I'm going to read from page three um, here on the Realm of the Ring Lords. Now, this is another book by Lawrence Gardner. Um, Ring Lords, this is really interesting about the Ring Lords because uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but Tolkien was a purveyor of the craft of the occult. He uh, knew so many things uh, there was nothing like this book the ring lords were written for this mythology that is held by the elite class of the world so that's why it sounds weird it's like what are they talking about movies here no we're talking about where this movie came from here so yeah. we're going to read a little bit about this 
uh, real quickly here. So in page three, uh, it says the Rosa Cruz emblem is recorded as far back as 3500 BC in Mesopotamia, and it has long been the distinguished device of the Sangreal, the blood of the Holy Grail, whose supporters became known as Ros Rosicrucians. Though traditionally referred to by the church as the Mark of Cain, this device is in fact the originally and long-standing mark of sovereignty in Mesopotamia and Egypt. The early kings of the secession were called dragons because they were anointed with the sacred fat of a large monitor lizard. And so there's a lot into that. There's so much into that. But this is this is what it says here. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 5, we see this character Dagon play a role here. And now remember, um, when we're talking about Palestine, we're going to be talking a little bit about that as well, because it plays a ma major part in all this. Um, I'm going to read this in 1 Samuel 5, uh, verse 1 through 4. It says, And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod rose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And when they arose early at the morning, morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. And in Isaiah 14, 28 through 30, it says, In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. Rejoice thou not, whole Palestina. So if this doesn't ring a bell, then you haven't been listening. Because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety. And I will kill thy root with famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. So this is a specific root that's talking about coming out of Palestine and relating it to cockatrices and serpent's roots. Now, as well, we, we just noticed that Palestine was the were the purveyors of Dagon, and we realized that Dagon was one of the chief gods of the Assyrians as well, who they claim to possibly come from. Dagon came out teaching them the things. We see it in Poseidon. We see it in uh, Triton. We see all of these different uh, gods that are associated with the same exact thing who started Atlantis, who started all of these different civilizations. It was a fish god that came out of the earth and started these civilizations. So what do you make of that? I don't know, David. What do you think? Well, the oldest name of the fish god was Oanes. Yes. And Oanes was the the oldest secret word in the mysteries that we know. And Oanes, the beast out of the sea, and then Dagon. And all of the people that want to disconnect Dagon from being a fish god, all of these people are the ones that are trying to rescue Catholicism. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, well, and, they'll, and they're just blowing smoke. I mean, Dagon is the fish god. I mean... It, it, that's just the way it is. There's too much ancient documentation to this fact to sensibly, sanely deny that fact. Yeah, and this picture proves a point right here. You know, you see this salt cross symbol that they talked about in the book that we just read on this Assyrian uh, king priest right here. And then to the right of it, this is the uh, the crest of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, you see all of the different things they have subjugated into them, which is a really interesting picture considering the three-headed eagle prophecy in Second Estrus. But all of these feathers represent kingdoms that they've subjugated underneath their power, which, uh, I don't know, man, a little sus. What do you think, David? Well, <laughs> I tell you what, yeah, that, uh, uh, yeah, that's real sus. Yeah, look you at know, all those that red crosses. Real sus. That just ain't right. Yeah. You know, and it does immediately bring the... Uh, the prophecy of the eagle and the feathers in second Estrus 11 it certainly does yeah and at one time there there was a there's an interesting we talked about this before the show there was an interesting division between the church and the uh dragon bloodline right we have this and you can see it in stories you david you were talking about it too but you could see it in stories uh with saint patrick for instance of him driving the serpents out of Ireland. Now there are no snakes in Ireland. Snake it's just not a place where snakes like to live because of the cold weather, etc. But there were this dragon bloodline in Ireland with the gay, gay, the the Gauls with the Druids, right? This was what oh, yeah. it's talking about here. Uh, you even have have Saint George who is displayed as killing a dragon. And it wasn't talking about the actual dragon. It was talking about the bloodline of these people, right? This is why they slayed him. He eventually was uh, sanctified as a priest, but or as a uh, saint, but 
it's interesting. David, you were talking about some other stuff too. Yeah, and they even have a, a statue of St. George the Dragon uh, up there at the UN. Yeah. And it is definitely uh, one of the most intriguing, fascinating subjects to me. It certainly is. I, yeah, to me too. I could re I could like talk about this stuff all day. Trying to convince this or you know condense this down to a hour long story is not the easiest to do. But thankfully, we keep talking about this for you know it seems like the last few weeks that are we've been able to like kind of piece more of this stuff together. But in page uh, twenty five to twenty six of Realm of the Ring Lords, I'm going to read from that one, uh, again here. I think this is the last one I'm going to read from here. There's other stuff, that, but I think this will kind of help us get it into the time frame that we're wanting to get into. So we're going to talk a little bit about the shining ones and this serpent fruit that comes out of Palestine, this, this fiery dragon. Um, and I want to read this. This is really interesting and it really makes a lot of sense in what we've talked about so far. So in page 25, it says the concept of calling the princely race of the grail, the shining ones, while also defining them as elves, dates well back into ancient Bible times and can be traced into Mesopotamia, Iraq, and Palestine. Okay, and it says, The shining ones of the Elohim, as indicated in Sumerian writings from as far back as 3rd millennium BC, were identified with the skies or the high places described as the An and often translated to mean heaven in this context. And it's really interesting because this... Uh, let me let me go on to think here. This video right here, this is um, Jordan Maxwell, I believe. And he, when it talk, comes to Druid stuff and Canaanite stuff, nobody uh, had much better education on this subject than him. So I want to play this short video. Then, David, I want some comments from you, uh, if you, if you can, here. So here we go. Women were told to listen to their god, the Lord of the Rings. So they were wearing ear, an ear ring. Men were to get married before suffering their god. So they would wear a wedding ring. Consequently, the king would be crowned before Saturn. Saturn would be the round crown or the corona, the ring. We know that Saturn was referred to as El, E-L. El is a name that was given to the planet Saturn. And therefore, if you were worshiping Saturn, you represent the law, you are referred to in church today as an elder. How did you get to be an elder? You got to be an elder because you were one of the elites. How did you get to be an elite? You got elected because through elections, all of our system is based on occult, mystical words and terms going back to the planet Saturn, going back to the Phoenician Canaanite system of banking. So interestingly, a lot of our language, of course, and this is oh, this is for the Latin, the Hebrew language, the Greek language. There's a very esoteric meaning underneath a lot of the words that are said. Now, does this mean that these words? are all bad to say no it doesn't because we are speakers of the of the english language we were born into this this is not something we fabricated on our own now i do believe people that'll be there will be people judged based on what they chose different words to be um because a lot of these people literally subjugate people because of words words play a huge part in subjugation and are a matter of life and death the bible says that words are life and death are in the power of the tongue and so when you place certain um terms over people and over nations it does have a magical effect and we've talked about this as far as enchantments go etc um but david um this is another another thing i wanted to read here i'm just going to read it since i've already got the verse up that kind of ties into the idea that kings were considered dragons is in ezekiel 29 verse 3 it says speak and say thus saith the lord god behold I'm against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of those rivers, which has said, my river is my own, and I have made it for myself. So the Bible even calls some of these kings, etc., cetera, um, dragons and serpents. And, and the word El is actually mentioned thousands of times in the Bible, and, and a lot of times it's actually mentioning a ruler, uh, which a human ruler, which is very interesting. David, do you have any comment on this? Because a lot of this stuff is is probably to a lot of people they never heard any of this stuff and of course we've talked about this stuff many times but the idea of pharaoh and the idea of these kings being dragons um how important is that for us to understand well it is and there is a, a, a lot in language and its etymology and there's a lot 
in the way they use the words, and El goes back to the head of the Canaanite pantheon, and Saturn has an original primacy in the host of heaven being worshipped and and Cush, the father of Nimrod, was worshipped in the host of heaven as the planet Saturn. Yeah. And we get here to to a, a beginning there. And there's even a uh, something that I have studied, and I can't just be dogmatic about it, but I'm tending to believe it, that from studies of the ancient uh, star charts and a lot of the quotes from the old uh, writers that Saturn was like a second sun in the antediluvian world. Mm. And uh, there's just a whole lot to that. But yeah. I'm tending to lean more and more to believe in that as time goes on. Yeah, and you did a show about Saturn and the relation to Cush, and there's a really interesting book yeah. about that, too. I think it was called The the Worship of the Dead. John Garnier. John yeah. Garnier. That, mm-hmm. What a great book on that subject. It and, is certainly and, very, very good. So, yeah, we're coming back to some some of the pristine concepts of the evolution of the whole uh, dark realm here. I agree. And, you know, one thing that I've thought about through all of this, why, you know, if we're in the time period when Satan's bound, why are the people still falling for this deception? And to me, it's really clear I think that the fact is that there were people that found this information. Uh, they found the kings of the earth now knew what happened. They knew the reset that took place when Jesus was crucified. Uh, they understood that. And so they took that information, they ran with it, and they produced a false history based on that information. And, you know, a lot of the gods that they worship aren't really gods. The Bible says that these aren't even gods you're worshiping. You know, you're worshiping the creation rather than a creator. You're worshiping these false gods, these these things. And they, so they've got this information. They think they have this great knowledge that's going to save them and prolong them through all of this stuff. But what really they have is old world information that is going to send them straight to hell. It really is what it is. You know, they this age right now, if it wasn't for these people who took advantage of this reset— Truth would be prevalent around the entire world. I really believe that. And if if we just think about what in the world that Ezekiel 29, 1 and 2 is talking about, about Pharaoh being that great dragon, and it is saying nothing less than he was being controlled by a creature in the sea. Yes. That had a powerful spirit that was a powerful spiritual entity that was able to control him. Yeah. We're talking about water spirits, spirits of the underworld. And back to what you were saying earlier, if we, we understand that uh, back in the antediluvian world in the time of uh, these these ancient judgments, that these entities and literally humans both took refuge, the line of Cain and these entities also in the heart of the earth, it would make a lot of sense. In the Bible, in the prophet Isaiah, he talks about in the end of time, the earth shall cast out the dead, yeah. you know? So, and that word again being refine. And, you know, you said something here about them hiding the face of the earth. We're getting ready to get into a really interesting part of the show here. You guys that have waited around for this, congratulations, because this is going to be fun. This is a video uh, by Robert Saper, and he is a um, human anthropologist. Uh, he has a very contrarian view of history. So uh, we do as well, but he is also not a Christian. He is an occultist in, in a lot of ways, but he does bring out some very interesting stuff that is uh, true. Do you know, the research that I've seen is true. We're not going to watch the whole video, but we're going to watch part of it here. If you want to go watch it, it's the videos up on YouTube. But I think that this is going to be really interesting to you. And it does explain a lot of the ideas of being in the earth. When we talked about Cain being in the earth, this could literally be what it's talking about. So um, hold your horses and we're going to watch this. So it is in this context that we start today's episode, which deals with ancient legends of serpents, dragons, snakes, and lizards, which were taken by some to mean that they were about a different species, maybe descended from the dinosaurs, a bipedal reptilian, which may or may not exist, but is not what is implied in the folklore about civilizations that once lived above and below the surface in antiquity, which over time were forgotten and only remembered by their symbolism, incorrectly interpreted as dinosaur people, rather than being from an advanced human race that in many respects were more advanced than we are today. That said, 
in the summer and fall of 1933, a Los Angeles mining engineer named G. Warren Shuffelt was surveying the LA area for deposits of oil, gold, and other valuable materials using his new invention called a radio x-ray. It's a rectangular box on a tripod with a glass cylinder that encapsulates a copper wire dangling a small metal plate. After acquiring funds to do excavating, Schufeld obtained permission from authorities to drill a 350-foot shaft. Schufeld claimed he was able to locate gold and other precious resources at great depths using his invention, which operated based on a principle involving electrical similarities between matter and was said to have worked even at a distance of many miles. Schufeld believed that by tuning into the individual frequency of a particular material, he could locate similar matter and that the emanations and gravitational factors of matter influenced the pendulum so that, in principle, no two separate things were exactly alike. One day, while taking readings near downtown Los Angeles, Schufeld's instruments revealed what seemed to be a pattern of tunnels leading from what is now the public library in the heart of downtown to the top of Mount Washington, and then to Pasadena in the north. What he had stumbled upon appeared to be a well-planned underground labyrinth, which fed into large rooms located at various points with deposits of gold in the chambers and passages. Some of the tunnels of the underground city ran west for 20 miles under the Santa Monica Bay, connected by a series of additional tunnels to the ocean where the ebb and flow of seawater forced air into the labyrinths, which allegedly provided fresh air and ventilation. The tide passing daily in and out of the lower tunnel portals and forcing air into the upper tunnels cleansed and sanitized the lower tunnels, according to the legend. Schuffelt began to research the history of the area and his quest to understand his findings led him to Chief Greenleaf, a Hopi Indian at a medicine lodge in Arizona, who told him about the legend of a lost civilization belonging to an advanced race of, quote, lizard people, not reptilians, but a racially Aryan people so named for the reverence of the serpent, snake, or lizard. They were allegedly a race of exceptional human beings who worshipped the serpent as a symbol of long life or spiritual renewal and immortality, laying out their underground labyrinth in the shape of a lizard. Schufelt's radio wave machine mapped the rooms and tunnels as subsurface voids, with the gold slabs as dark areas showing perfect geometrical angles. Water had seeped into some of the tunnels and several of the rooms, including the largest, were flooded. Schufelt was prepared to use divers to explore the submerged areas when they finally broke into the subterranean city. By the beginning of February 1934, the first shaft had reached a depth greater than 250 feet and was still being dug despite difficulty caused by the water encountered in its path. Several newspaper articles featured updates on the project. According to Schuffelt, the lizard people kept their secrets in a key room near the Second Street Tunnel. This underground room contained 37 four-foot-long golden tablets that recorded the history of the ancient Mayans and the origin of the human race. The legends are similar to other myths, such as that of the Hopi, who claim to have emerged from subterranean tunnels beneath the Grand Canyon long ago aided by what they called ant people, who again, did not resemble upright walking insects, but got their name because of the underground network of tunnels, which are reminiscent of tunnels built by ants. The legend said that about four to 5,000 years ago, great cataclysmic fires on the surface, likely caused by an enormous meteor shower, fell on the western coast, covering an area of hundreds of miles wide. Winslow Crater in northern Arizona is only one of the pieces that fell from the sky at that time. The ancient builders, purportedly more advanced intellectually than modern humans, 
tunneled through rock using chemicals instead of picks and shovels, and constructed huge domed caverns housing thousands of families. So greatly advanced scientifically were these people that, in addition to perfecting a chemical solution by which they bored underground without removing earth and rock, they also developed a cement far stronger and better than any in use in modern times with which they lined their tunnels and rooms. Thousands of people were killed, their crops wiped out, dwellings destroyed, and the forest set on fire. Survivors met and began plans for a safe area to be used as refuge in the event of another catastrophe. They were preparing for an oncoming apocalypse, which they imagined as periodic global cataclysms that would come as a great tongue of fire enveloping the earth. As the lizard people burrowed deeper underground, they kept records of the history of mankind etched onto giant gold tablets. Soon the lizard people had built a complex maze of underground tunnels and antechambers using advanced chemicals to ease their process. Inside this vast network of tunnels and catacombs were 16 treasure rooms, each allegedly containing enormous gold tablets with perfect corners, sides, and ends. The subterranean complex Shuffelt had discovered was designed to accommodate thousands of people and valuable personal belongings, utensils, and food were stored in the complex along with historical records and gold treasures. As a result of the information he received from Chief Little Greenleaf, Schofield believed that the underground complex he had discovered was one of 13 built all over the Southwest. All right, so that, that video is interesting. I've never heard of this civilization under L.A. before until I saw this video. David, have you heard of it? I've not heard of it till now, no. that they're using in their high rail systems that go all the way across the country. Uh, they have enough food, resources, etc., to last them a thousand years underneath the ground. The Bible speaks of the kings of the earth, the rich of the earth, the mighty of the earth, being basically entombed inside of the world, asking the rocks to fall down on them, to hide them from the face of the one that comes, Jesus, right? To hide them from his face. Uh, even in the book of Enoch, you see that the elites are like, oh, now we worship you, God. Now... We didn't know that you were the God of everything, but now we do, so we're going to try to worship you. And then you see this scene of these angels carrying them off to torture them, to take them off into hell. And this is what the elites can have to look forward to. But this is the idea of what they're doing here goes back to this uh, time period, uh, time frame of where they tunneled underground to miss the end of the age because they understand as well as the Bible understands, that there is a time that comes where the the earth kind of cleans itself. It just happens over and over again at the end of these ages. And they've been able to try to escape these uh, throughout time, which that was the perfect example. Their goal was to escape the coming destruction. And so I believe that they did. And I believe this is where we get all of these uh, ideas from, from the Indians and from all of these civilizations. I mean, even you think of Germany, they believe that there's an Aryan race called the Vril, of these tall Aryan races that are either underground, also in Antarctica, they're, they believe this to be the case. They believe these are the people that are um, ruling society and are the people that have the information that we need. And you see, you know, we talked about this in some of the other shows, you see these kingly lineages going all over the world, subjugating the people. And what they brought was knowledge, right? They brought information, they brought technology, they brought civilization, they brought money, they brought all of the things that humans naturally desire to be comfortable. They brought all of those things with them, which would have given them probably a, an exalted title, thinking, man, these guys are these guys are wizards. These guys are Merlins. These guys are dragon people, right? Because they not only that, they did look like the dragon people. As we see in Lamech, it describes how the seraphim actually, you know, this is this looks like one of the children of the seraphim. Like, what, what's going on here? This is what they look like. So, um David, do you have anything else to add before I go on to this? Well, that was some pretty wild stuff there that guy was laying out. And I'll just say I believe that, and I believe it even more than that. I remember we did a midnight ride several years ago with Timothy Alberino, and he was talking about 
evidence that, I mean, it's just a fact that underneath these Catholic churches in South America, which are there over built over these pagan uh, worship sites, that there are tunnels that go for hundreds of miles that connect them with other of these worship sites. There's a huge underground network of tunnels. Yeah. We've seen also, and Donna come up with something interesting uh, just a couple weeks ago, an ancient map of Ergarthia or the, the hollow earth. And on it, well, one of the very prominent sites listed was Mammoth Cave, which isn't too far from us. Yeah. Now they admit to over 500 miles yes. of cave system. And I believe there's much more. And in the, the island of Malta, there are a massive underground cave systems there. Yeah. And there was an actually an incident, and we talked about this, uh, Tracy and I, quite a bit on a FOJC Sunday Night Live where we were talking about, and it was in 1933, they had a class trip down there, and they had tied with a rope. The, they had the kids roped together and a rope tied around them to the front of the cave. Yeah. And the cave, the, the big rope got severed. All 30 of those kids were lost. The teacher oh my was gosh. lost. They searched for them for like 30 days and they couldn't find these kids. Oh, man. And they have just blocked that off. The whole area, wow. good idea, probably. But there are all kinds of reports in these Malta caves of the cryptoid creatures, giants, you name it, the whole thing. Yeah. And I believe that just like, uh, you know, he said in the Southwest, 13 or whatever centers, I believe that all over this good old flat earth that you can go almost anywhere through these underground uh, connections, you could travel all over under these and i think there's uh there's and you know why you know nasa the the space exploration nasa owns nuclear underground earth bores yep. you know so like what does the space agency need with earth boring machines right uh, yeah exactly they know they know yeah, and to recap, because people said my mic was muted after the thing, I just want to recap what David's saying there is kind of what I was saying in a way, too, just kind of recap on, on the idea I was bringing about the deep underground military bunkers still being used by the elites to this day to uh, for security through the ages, the switching of the ages that has continued. Uh, that is something that the Flood's a perfect example of is the kind of just the earth being made void again. And then a new civilization popping up. They know about this. This is why they knew about the flood. They know that there's another one coming. And then they're, they know about all of these things. So they create these underground places for them to live in. And the Bible talks about the great men of the earth being under the in, in the earth, right? Entombed inside the earth, at praying to God to have the rocks fall on, on them because they're scared, right? They're scared to death. And it also talks about the elite being drug off by the angels to their own destruction. And so this... this uh, like David said, this this going on is a huge part of how they live. And I don't know exactly, uh, I think one of the reasons is because you have people, things like mermaids, which are you know considered mythology to stay, but the Book of Enoch talks about these sirens. You have all of these creatures that it says that the seed of the woman will basically hunt them down and try to kill them, smash their head. So the idea that they're hidden makes perfect sense. But now I believe we're in a time period now to where they no longer need to be hidden. Their bloodline no longer needs to be hidden because there's nobody there to really contend with this. They've, they've civilized everybody. Um, men are not the same as they used to be and we're dumb, right? Knowledge is power. Um, and when they have the knowledge and we don't, then they can say anything we want and we're going to believe them. And at the great pyramid, there was buried there at the great pyramid, a large, very sophisticated boat. Yes. And the same reason why in the in South America they would build these way up high in the mountains. They had knowledge of not only the flood of Noah and the the destruction of Atlantis, but many cataclysms that had taken place, and uh, the stream from heaven that Plato talked about. Yep. And they were preparing themselves for the coming cataclysms, Agreed. no doubt. Yeah. I agree, David. And you, you know, we've talked about earlier, and this is kind of moves on to our next 
uh, part of the segment here, which well, I, I know we're running a little bit over, guys, but hopefully you can bear with me. Hopefully you're enjoying this enough to uh, keep going. I know it gets late after a certain period of time. My brain kind of goes haywire, but I've got – Lots of coffee in this tattered old cup right here, and uh, so we're we're gonna try to keep this going. It's almost we're, we're almost done here. Bear with me. I know you guys are having fun. Um, let me know in the chat if you guys are good with me continuing. So, we talked about these underground places. Now, obviously, and since 1947, we've been hearing about spacecrafts coming to Earth. We've been told the story of these aliens from outer space coming down to Earth and um, bring being you know crashing and creating different sites that house these aliens. Now, I would submit to you that the idea of these aliens coming down from Earth already happened a long time ago. It happened when the the dragon and uh, cast all the, the, the third of the angels down to Earth. And now the dragon is now cast from the Earth into the heart of the Earth, which is a little different, like we were talking about earlier. And I may have this a little bit mixed up, but the ideology behind this is that I believe they are actually in the Earth. They're not coming from outer space. They're coming from underneath the waters, which is so many different people have seen crafts coming out of the waters, yeah. um, which totally makes sense if there's a dome around the earth, like the Bible says, which makes sense why NASA's, NASA's a bunch of bull crap, why they, uh, why they, you know, you can see that they photoshopped all their images because we can't make it out of here, neither can they, uh, but they've created this ideology that they are coming from another planet, coming down uh, and doing this. Now, I believe that these UFOs, like I said, are coming from out of the ground. There's a certain types of beings that are coming through this. And this video we're getting ready to watch is, is an interview done uh, a long time ago by uh, for, from a guy named Lear. And most of you guys will hear of Lear. If you've watched Skinwalker Ranch, you've noticed that he was uh, in, in league with all the alphabet agencies, intelligence agencies, and when he bought the Skinwalker Ranch. And they did numerous tests, numerous tests. Um, Recently, I saw somebody had interviewed him, and he himself is really uh, in. Uh, he can't even have a private life anymore because of the information that he knows. Uh, as rich as this man is, they still call him, according to him, and ask him how his family's doing. You know, letting him know that he's still on the hook, right? He's still on the hook for this. So, in this video, he talks a little bit about the Grays, and I believe he talks a little bit about the tall, blonde-headed Aryan-type aliens as well. So, we're gonna talk, look a little bit about this. But I would submit to you that this is some kind of a remnant of a serpent race that literally lives within the earth and not from outer space. Uh, I just don't believe that. I don't I'm, believe that. You're so spot on there. All right, so here we go. You were saying also these gray ones are the ones that we see most of the time, and you said that most of, uh, that there are a lot of different motives for them being here. The gray ones, uh, what kind of a deal we got going with them? Is, uh, that, is that the bunch that you su suggest we've made a deal with? for military technology? Well, I think we made a deal with them, and their ultimate, uh, what they want to do is regenerate their own race. Now, apparently, they're either, they've are either they either had some kind of nuclear accident, or they're on the backside of a evolutionary genetic curve, and they're going downhill instead of uphill. In other words, in the autopsies, of which I have two, we found out that their digestive system is atrophied. They don't, they can't eat through their mouth anymore. You know how they eat? Well, they, these cattle mutilations, they take the uh, hormones and the enzymes from those cattle and they spread it on their skin, and their skin absorbs the nutrients and then excretes the waste back through their skin. And if you read uh, Whitley Strieber's book or listen to him talk, he talks about when he's seen them uh, doing this to their skin and they're, they're, they're scraping the waste off. Now, these cattle mutilations, there's been a film made about that, and perhaps in a couple of minutes we can take a look at, at some excerpts of that. Yeah, Strange Harvest was a, was a good one, but um, uh, another thing that happened here on March 4th, there was a documentary uh, released on uh, the best UFO photos that have been taken so far, including a minute and 38 seconds of videotape. Now, what happened is in November, this guy took these photos, took it into the TV station. They thought it was great, but nobody would believe it. So they spent three months um, checking the validity of the, uh, uh, checking the, uh, 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 authenticating the videotape and checking out the credibility of the witness. And when they had it all down, they put out this documentary, 30 minutes. I mean, it's ironclad. They're here. But do you think it got on the network? No, it just showed locally in Pensacola. We have some of that, and perhaps when we come back, we can take a look at it. So stay with us for more of On the this is Robert Lear talking about them. Now, I believe that obviously there's misinformation that Robert Lear is generally going to give out to people. He's not going to give 100% information. But when he says that 
a lot of the information that we've got we've got from the grays and got from these aliens i do believe that i believe that there was a huge explosion in information that happened or in close to the 40s david if i'm not mistaken this is when a lot of big things started happening even before that but this is when you also have the working by Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons to open up a gate and a portal. So these these beings literally could be also interdimensional beings that have to do with portals that go underground. We've seen this uh, symbology all over the place too, the coiled serpent symbology, the portal symbology, literally taking these beings from one place to another. And even with Bigfoot, right? I've been watching this show uh, and it's just somebody that came to this the – Pentecost thing told me about it. And it was about Alaskan Bigfoot. Have you seen that yet, David? I've seen several Alaskan Bigfoot shows. I don't know if I've seen that one. So in Alaska, there's this tribe of people in this, and they they're in this this port area where I can't remember what the name of the port is called, and it's on Discovery Channel. For those of you who want to look it up, and their people move from that area because there was de- dozens of people killed by what they're calling. Um, Nick too, I believe is was uh, Bigfoot. It's Bigfoot, basically about Bigfoot. But the the way it's described is interdimensional. Um, it's described as causing electrical problems with uh, with different things, making people sick when they approach it, and also leaving these huge footprints and breaking trees and doing all the things that Bigfoot do, does. But um, very conclusively, they believe that it is interdimensional, just like at Skinwalker Ranch. You have some of the same phenomenon associated associated with their Skinwalkers. You have this with Bigfoot as well, leading you to believe yeah. that this portal that was open is legitimately possibly yeah. what it is. Yeah. That was a very interesting incident in Project Blue Book. It happened in the early 60s uh, record. when John F. Kennedy was a senator, and he yeah. sent there was an incident when the uh, United States Navy was doing, in, in the North Sea, they were doing a, an exercise with NATO a naval exercise, and there was a huge UFO come out of the ocean that just all kinds of people saw. Yeah. Well, they wrote a absolutely crazy explanation to whitewash it, and John F. Kennedy sent Alan Hynek there to investigate it, and there was a submarine sent down to investigate that never come back. (laughs) So there you go. I mean, and there have been so much of this stuff yeah. of the um of the things and they're you know that they're just a big bunny hole that we could rabbit hole the rabbit holes not bunny holes but <laughs> uh the flying submarines that were developed by the nazis at the end of the war absolutely fascinating that they actually had flying submarines yes it is it is fascinating yeah. it's, it's mind-blowing and you know the idea that this this scientists and all of these things come together and they're interesting that the Germans were trying to find these Aryans and, and I believe they probably found them. Yeah. Um, they probably found these yeah. things. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing, man. And you know, um, so to explore, to, to kind of wrap this thing up, explore no one more area of this now in the very end times, because we believe in the dispensation of uh, all millennialism basically to where we believe that we are in the thousand year reign coming to the end of it to where satan is going to be released this is an actual prophecy associated with that time because it talks about the one from the pit being released right who could that be i don't know who who is bound in a pit we're going to find out but anyways we're talking about apollo's the destroyer apollo destroyer but we're also talking about some interesting entities that i think that we need to talk about because this is becoming an actual talking point for people with near-death experiences, and I'm going to explain that and show that here in just a second. Now, this is the verse in Revelation 16. It says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. We talked about that before. You know, the river Euphrates, these angels that are bound underneath the Euphrates, waiting to come out to bring war. And it says, um, That they way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Interesting. These are the entities mentioned in Revelation, right? When we have the end times, we have the false prophet, we have the beast, and we have the actual dragon, all of these powered entities. This is where our triple crown symbolism, I believe, comes from. When you have the triple crown symbolism uh, symbolism, uh, all through all the Templars, all of the Huns, all of the... um, 
kings of Assyria, all of the English kings, all of these fisher kings, all these three count symbolism, which I believe has a lot to do with this. And then we have, it says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of the almighty. Now, interesting, right? Well, I want to show you guys this video because I think that, um, when I when I saw it, this is a new video that just popped up recently, and there's other videos that I saw saying almost the exact same thing, which is really kind of interesting to me, considering that this isn't supposed to happen until the Euphrates River drives up, which is exactly what it looks like it's doing, and it may be completely dried up by the year 2030, which is pretty frightening as well. So, anyways, this is this is this video. I think that it's worth the watch. Um, we'll watch part of it, and I just want you guys to see it and there were gurneys around and there was equipment that was hanging from the ceiling it was like a facility or a clinic or something and right in front of me there were there were beings there were these three short little hooded guys and they looked exactly like those beings in the movie communion the guys i saw they were in front of me they had big smiles on their face and they had these dark hoods and uh, squatty little bodies. And one woman wrote to me and she said, I was taken by these many times as a kid. And she goes, I called them the Warthog Men. The Warthog Men have come and, and taken me. And she said, when I saw that movie Communion, uh, my, you know, I dropped my popcorn. And says that they looked exactly like that. And I've gotten a number of emails from people saying, thank you for doing this because I thought it was just mine. So anyway, yeah, they, they look kind of, um, I don't know, creepy is the right word, but they look different. But for me, they were sweethearts. And they were saying things like, how was it? What did you learn? What can you tell us? And I was extremely confused. All of a sudden I was in this place with these beings from a cartoon, basically. And one of them stepped forward and he took a long look at me and then he turned to the other two and he said, he doesn't remember us. And they all started giggling. And I was like, well, guys, I'm having a little trouble. All right, so that's about the extent of what I wanted to show you in that video. Now he goes on to talk about basically, it doesn't matter what we do type thing. We're all good, we're not going anywhere type thing. The idea behind you know the serpent is you're not going to die. Everything's fine. No big deal. It doesn't matter what you do. Guess what? You're good, right? This was the whole idea behind this guy's testimony. But I thought it was really interesting what he talked about those those things. What do you think about that, David? I think it absolutely is. And um, if you All think about it, there's different um, the in the description that people give in alien abductions. You've got different kinds. You've got the Nordic. You've got the Greys. You got the reptilians. And there were different clans of Nephilim on the earth. We had the Zanzuman, we had the Anakam, and different tribes. So different clans, when they would inbreed with these fallen angels, they would produce different types of these entities. So it, it does really make sense. And I think we could probably even make some more direct connections there with a little effort. I, th I think it wouldn't be very hard at <laughs> we all. We might have to take the effort. Yeah, we might have to. And so this is the this is the last thing I want to read to you guys tonight because it kind of sets up where I'm going to be going the next time I present. David's show next week is the perfect middle to all of this that's going to take place. But um, I want to read this to you guys because it's important to understand that since we are in the time period of Revelation 20, um, getting ready to be in verse 7 of Revelation 20, I think it's important to understand where the subjugation comes from. And of course, like I said, I will be going into way more detail about this. And we've talked about some of these things before, but this is another insight that I think we need to see because it ties in 100% with the Dragon Kings and it ties into 100% between those who are in control over all of the powers of the dragon, right? And so I'm going to read this to you guys. Let me pull this up so you can see it. This is Revelation 20, verse 7 through 8. And it says, And when the house or when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. So it it tells us that the four quarters of the earth, the, the nations that are represented here are Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So I'm just going to leave you guys with that and let you know that we uh, that this whole subjugation thing that takes place has to do with a giant deception that is going to be fed to the kings of the earth as if they're not already deceived as it is. Now, can I say that the kings have always been deceived? I can't because I don't know. 
I don't know where they were. I know there was a time when one of the kings became a believer and, and uh, you know, things happened. But th- overall, this deception, whether or not it's something that's taken place recently or, or however long ago it is, I know there are people that would disagree with certain aspects of it, and I can't pretend to know everything. I can only pretend to know what I've read, right? I can only know what God has revealed to me or what I've read or what, you know, people have talked about. Um, but I do know this. The all of these nations are going to be represented underneath Gog and Magog, and this they're going to be deceived in a big way. They're going to think they have it right. They're going to think that they are getting ready to rule the world, and they're going to be of great disappointment. Um, I don't believe that it's impossible for them to repent. I don't believe that it's impossible for them to see the light and repent because the Bible said, you know, I speak to you in mysteries because if they heard what we're saying, if they, they might actually believe and repent, right? And it's talking directly to people who have their eyes blinded. So will they repent? I don't know. They're probably pretty blinded at this point by their riches, blinded by their desires. Uh, David talked about Dan, about uh, in the book of the Testament of Dan, I believe it is, there it talks about, if you read that whole chapter, David quoted one verse from there, but if you read that whole chapter, it talked about how Dan, the tribe of Dan, will be given over to their lust. They'd be given over to all these things. Yeah in the end times that are going to turn them away from God. You know, it's a warning to the tribe of Dan. It's a warning saying, hey, man, look, you guys are going to be given over to anger. You're going to be given over all these things. You're like a warrior tribe, but you're also going to be given over to these horrible things in the end times. And, you know, watch yourself. Keep track that you don't do this. Uh, but it's apparent that this is exactly what happened. And with that being said, David, that's that's all I want to talk about tonight. I could go on, but I think that it, right here is a good place to end this and so we can continue the conversation another time and I, and I appreciate your guys attention on this and david if you have anything else you would like to say before we wrap this up i'd appreciate it well yeah they're just so many we'll just have to say to be continued because yeah. there's so many things here on the table that would just be deeply fascinating to to explore and i know that this is going to raise questions about the 144 000, or not the 144,000, but the millennial reign. Yeah. And uh, I just did last week, I did about an hour and 45 minute teaching just last week on the millennial reign. Yeah. And it's up on um, the YouTube channel. He walks with us everywhere under the Sound Doctrine playlist there. So I think that might help you. Uh, yeah. It's my latest teaching on it. I've taught lots of lessons. There are also lessons right here on the Midnight Ride that we've done that John could put links to. Mm -hmm. But it is really important to understand that when Satan is cast back in in Revelation chapter 12, He'll be very angry because he knows he has but a short time. Yeah. And then he will have the power to gather the nations unto Armageddon. And it's so, so many people, if you're believing the prophetic scenario that's popularly put forth, you believe you're taking the best shot Satan can give you right now. <laughs> and that is so far from true. Yeah. And we need to be preparing ourselves now for that time. And that will be. Uh, concurrent with the removal of the strainer. So there's some wild time. And also it talks about literally as in the days of Noah, the earth casting out the dead. And I believe that uh, the Bible means just what it says. And these entities are going to be back. So it's very important to understand biblically what's going to happen and to understand how this ties in with the, with, with the history of mankind, because the word of God unfolds it all. And how sad is it? If you, you know, like John said, from all of his early church rearing all through Bible school, he was taught that Sethite theory. And if you believe the Sethite theory, you go, theory, you're not going to get none of this. You know, you're not going to get any of it. Yeah. You know, so it's so important to to study the Word of God, and I'm very thankful that we have a group of people that are interested in in studying things like this because you better believe it's important. And, and something I didn't mention that I think is worth mentioning before we go is the Kazarian people, which are the Ukrainian people. This is why they have the Tomga and all of that as their symbol in Ukraine. And this is not conspiracy theory. This is just straight up facts um, because Tomga was actually uh, one of the sons of, uh, you know, Japheth over there. And they had, they, there's all connected, but they were known as the people of the dragon. Yeah. Um, and now we're in a world war three associated with them. I don't think it's a coincidence. Nope. guys. 
Not at all. Yeah, and they're allied uh, with that the that whole Tartarian alliance we've talked about so much, and with Tartaria taken in all all the way through Russia in, into China, and they got a little dragon thing going on, yeah. and we've talked about from Estrus, the dragons of the east. Yeah. I tell you what, the dots are connecting. The yeah. dots are connecting, and I mean, it's it's here, it's here. And and man, I mean, you mentioned the Chinese, but people, a lot of people don't really meant and realize is that one of these red haired peoples were in the first emperor's tomb. Like he was considered a leader of the first emperor, emperor Chinese, like in the same where they have all the terracotta warriors, there's a tall red headed giant with tattoos all over him, a Tartarian money, mummy, the same people, man. So like even the China, the, yeah, they have dragon, but that's because guess what? Where'd they come from? Yeah. You know, so anyways, uh, we could kill, we, we're going to keep going on. Well, we enough said, if we're, <laughs> we're, the only way to stop talking here is stop talking. Yes. So we'll stop talking and do a little pounder's pound up in here. Yes, sir. Let's do it. All right, then. Now, if you like this broadcast and <laughs> you want to help us with our little uh, struggles with YouTube to get our um, algae rhythms popping in the right way, Get on there and give it a little pounder's pound. Hit that like button on the count of three. So let's let's count them down. Let's do it. One, One two, two, three. Boom. boom. Man, I, I could feel that one over here. Could you feel that, David? I think it reverberated Ooh. down into them tunnel systems. I think so. And so hopefully it'll get out to all the people of the world. Even the people underground will hear this. And uh, that's what we hope. And we, like I said, we thank you guys so much for your support. Subscribe if you enjoyed this. Go check out David's channel as well. And guys, let's let's do this. Let's make an impact on the world. Your support means everything to us. And the more that you guys support us, the more we can get out there. You know, this is just this is how this is how things work in the world. We support what we love. We uh, from the abundance of our heart, we we support it. Right. This is why right now in the world, the occult system is so powerful because the money has been supported in their favor for a very, very long time. So we're thankful for you guys that do support us so we can continue this work, get out to as many people as possible before the time comes when we are shut out because that time's coming, I believe, pretty soon. And David, end us out. Once again, with great thankfulness to John and Now You See TV, to our magnificent Now You See TV audience, we just love you. And to the good Lord above, we're just so thankful. We know that any good that comes from our humble efforts is all because of him. So with that, until next week, 10 p.m. Central, high five and good night, everybody, from the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up.